Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Marriage as a social unit pre-existed the nation-state and parliaments. It is common to all cultures, and its very rationale was about the best way for raising and socialising the next generation, providing the certainty and stability of their biological parents and the diversity of a female and male role model. In its variations between cultures, the man-woman-children element of marriage is the common denominator. It is not about the adults, but the potential children. It is other-focused, not self-focused. As the atheist philosopher Bertrand Russell even opined, <coughs> it is through children alone that sexual relations became of importance to society and worthy to be taken cognizance of by a legal institution. Our own Australian Law Reform Commission noted marriage in Indigenous communities as a central feature of traditional Aboriginal societies, and the union was considered to be strengthened by the birth of the first child. So here too we have marriage and raising children inextricably interlinked. So it's not surprising that the UN in its charter acknowledges as a fundamental human right the right of marriage to men and women to, you've guessed it, form a family. In other words, have children. Same-sex marriage is not a recognised human right, such as freedom of speech, marriage between a man and a woman, and freedom of religion, amongst others. That, of course, of itself does not stop parliaments from legislating for it, and I suspect at the end of this process Australia will have changed its law on marriage. It's a change I regret for the sake of our children, but recognise Australians voted for such a change. But let's be clear. What were Australians asked in the postal survey? Should the law be changed to allow same-sex couples to marry? The legislation before us is not restricted to same-sex couples. It goes a lot further. The explanatory memorandum tells us under item 3, definition of marriage, at paragraph 13, same-sex couples and others will be able to marry. For example, this would include an intersex person and a gender-diverse person who is legally recognised as having a non-specific gender. The bill, therefore, goes further than that which was approved by the Australian people and adopts the ideology of gender fluidity, which is part of the much discredited and rightly reviled and Orwellianly misnamed Safe Schools program. If gender fluidity were part of the campaign, the result may well have been different. And if this was always intended, then the question should have been explicit. Australians deserve an explanation as to why it wasn't. So much for a simple amendment to allow gays to marry. The gender agenda is already being stretched and the bill goes a lot further than that for which the Australian people gave their approval. Many yes-voting Australians rightly feel betrayed that we are debating changes for which they did not vote. During the lead-up to the postal survey, we were told by yes advocates nothing would change other than gay people would be allowed to marry. We now know that to be incorrect. When our fellow Australians engaged on the consequences argument, there was a shift in popular sentiment. From an alleged consensus position of over 70 per cent in support, we saw a 10 per cent collapse to 60 per cent in the actual survey result. To staunch the collapsing support, Australians were told by Yes Advocates that religious freedoms would be protected. Indeed, one promised their support for religious freedom was stronger than their support for changing the Marriage Act. Yet now we are being asked to wave through the changes without any substantial protection to freedoms, such as parental rights to guide the moral education of their children, freedom of speech, freedom of religion and freedom of conscience, all of which are fundamental, well-established, internationally accepted rights enshrined in treaties and covenants, rights 
which are inalienable to each of us, rights which government can't take away nor give because they are inalienable. As a direct result of the consequences argument in this debate, we are now to have a full inquiry into religious freedoms. But after this bill, having been told religious freedoms are more important, it seems strange we should deal with these matters in reverse order. Further, we were told by a yes advocate, the key question is who do you trust? A coalition government that respects the rights and liberties of the individual or Labor and the Greens who don't care about religious liberty? And here we are with a bill that Labor and Greens have accepted as a starting point, which does restrict freedoms. Even Mr Shorten said he wouldn't support legislation which impinges on religious freedoms. Well, it's time to deliver on those promises. Given the Australian people were told that these freedoms would not be assaulted or compromised, one would have expected full agreement with a proposed Patterson bill. Yet, regrettably, the vehemence of the opposition from some quarters exposes there are consequences and they actually want the rights-restricting consequences, consequences which are there for all to see in other countries that have changed the definition of marriage, consequences threatening private schools, closure of charities and parental rights. These are not imaginary. For example, in the United Kingdom, the Charities Commission for England and Wales removed the charitable status of 19 Catholic adoption and foster agencies because they preferred not to adopt or foster to same-sex couples. In Johns and Derby County Council 2011, the English High Court supported a local council decision that a Christian couple with traditional views on sexual ethics who had very successfully fostered many children would not make suitable foster carers anymore because they would not be open to promoting or accepting a homosexual lifestyle. In Washington State, Baronel Stutzman was successfully sued in the Benton County Superior Court for declining a request to provide flowers for a same-sex wedding. Flowers had been provided previously to the complainant, so the issue for the florist was not the person's attribute but the particular activity which caused the issue. In the United Kingdom, the Vishnitz Jewish Girls Primary School failed their school assessment on one criteria, which was its inadequate promotion of homosexuality and gender reassignment in a primary school. There is no doubt there are consequences, consequences which sacrificed long-established rights on the altar of an aggressive, politically correct agenda. We can avoid this travesty in Australia by acknowledging the reality of these disturbing examples from overseas and provide the protections needed. The substantial no vote at 38.4 per cent cannot be arrogantly dismissed as of no consequence. It is, in fact, three to four times the Green vote. To assert, because the no vote lost, that its voice should be obliterated from the public discourse is a display of ugly hubris. The parliament has an opportunity to deliver for the yes voter by changing the definition of marriage and the no voter by alleviating and ameliorating some of their very valid concerns. No voters are good, decent Australians. They voted for fairness and love, amongst other things, just as much as yes voters. To deliberately alienate 38 per cent of your population is never wise. Indeed, most statesmen on winning an election reach out and recognise not everyone voted for them and they will seek to govern for all. Similarly, on this occasion, where a victory has been won for the yes case, it is important to recognise the concerns of the no campaigners and voters. Having spoken with literally thousands of them, I know them to be decent, loving, concerned Australians. Indeed, two no advocates I know who, when facing abuse from a yes voter, invited them for a coffee and chat 
which saw both yes voters break down, cry and apologise. No voters and campaigners are people that live next door. They are at the next workstation. They served you your coffee or lunch. They are inherently good people who were willing to embark on a campaign where the odds were stacked against them from the beginning. The media and the celebrities were relentless, yet the no campaigners held their course. They had to go to work, passing yes propaganda in their very own offices, or physically work under the so-called rainbow flag. I take this opportunity to salute and thank all those who helped the no campaign through advocacy and donations. Their efforts saw a substantial change in public sentiment. I place on record my sincere thanks to the thousands of volunteer campaigners who advocated for marriage, especially when they knew from the beginning it would be a difficult campaign. They put principle before populism and made the case for marriage in a calm and respectful way. I pay particular tribute to Lyle Shelton, Karina Ockertel, Sophie York, Damien Wilde, along with the mothers and the tradie who were the public face of the campaign, and Israel Folau. I also pay tribute to all those involved at senior levels in the marriage campaign behind the scenes, including Tim James and Steve Doyle, amongst many others. From a Tasmanian perspective, I want to thank the hundreds of Tasmanian volunteers as well as the leadership in the Tasmanian campaign, including Mark Brown and Alex Sidhu, and the coordinators and those that letterboxed, door knocked, made advocacy calls, engaged in letters to the editors and social media advocacy. I thank Karen Dixon. The actual evidence in favour of retaining marriage is a man-woman-children construct which saw overwhelming support for marriage in this parliament in 2004 has not changed. The windsock of public opinion has. To remain true to your beliefs in the face of changing public sentiment, vitriol and threats displays character and integrity. And for parliamentarians, I suspect, the public will have a higher regard for those who are willing to take a stand on an issue of principle. The public knows there is backbone, principle and integrity, and that the latest opinion poll does not determine one's morality, principles or policy. Indeed, I am reminded of the Republic campaign, where the electorate that John Howard represented voted yes, yet he remained a staunch monarchist and the electorate Mr Kim Beasley, the Labor leader, voted, voted no, yet he remained a staunch Republican. The electorates re-elected both gentlemen at the next election. And so I think that the electorate can distinguish between a particular point of view on an issue and their high regard for their parliamentary representative. As someone told me the other day, it's only dead fish that go with a flow. It's only the live fish that have the capacity to swim against the current. Mr Acting Deputy President, it would be incongruous if the parliament, in establishing a new right in relation to marriage, jettisoned, threw overboard and trashed the long-established rights and parental control of their children's moral education, freedom of speech, freedom of religion and freedom of conscientious objection. Given the unequivocal promises made by both the Prime Minister and the Leader of the Opposition, I trust the Parliament will have no difficulty in supporting the suite of amendments moved by my colleagues, Senators Fawcett and Patterson, amendments which will allow the definition of marriage to be altered whilst providing the protections which were guaranteed. A failure to do so will be rightly judged harshly against us by our fellow Australians. The postal survey result does not provide a licence for the parliament to trample on our long-established and accepted rights. Many yes voters will, in particular, 
feel betrayed having voted yes on the strength of guarantees from both the Prime Minister and the Leader of the Opposition, as will others who accept that nothing else would change and those that voted yes simply to get rid of the issue. And for the 20 per cent who didn't vote, I suspect the denial of fundamental freedoms may well arouse them from their slumber and awaken their political interest. The same polls predicting a yes vote also gave overwhelming support to protecting our long-held and deeply cherished liberties of parental stewardship over children, freedom of speech, religion and conscience. Excuse me in conscience. As for my position, I have no doubt I am currently in a minority amongst my fellow Australians on the definition of marriage. Similarly, I am in no doubt I am in the majority amongst my fellow Australians in my advocacy for the protection of their long held and deeply cherished freedoms. The Parliament's challenge is to deliver on both same-sex marriage and the full protection of our freedoms. <laughs>